The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 1955. The clerk will report the bill. Is it House File? I have, I have it as a Senate, Senate File. Senate File. <clears throat> the first Senate bill on the file calendar number for the day is Senate File 1955. The clerk will report the bill. Thank you. Senate file number 1955, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to state government establishing a budget for the Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang, to explain Senate file 1955. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, today I'm happy to present you the agriculture budget bill that members of the Agriculture Committee Staff and I have worked hard to pull it all together. As a first time chair of not just any committee, but the Agriculture Committee, I get head scratches and frequently ask questions about why a young Asian woman like me is interested in farming. Little do they know that I represent a long history of farmers. My ancestors who practiced slash and burn in the old homeland of Laos, who built terraces of rice fields in the lush mountains of China, and to this day, the Hmong in French Guyana produce 80% of the fruits and vegetables feeding the country. And if you don't know where that is, that's in South America, a territory the size of Indiana that sits right above Brazil. We have Hmong people there who have settled as ref refugees who literally feed the country. But here in the US, I represent a generation of farmers that have been left out. The story of the Hmong people cannot be a story without agriculture, because that is how families built their livelihoods. And that is what I see in our Minnesota farmers. Farming as a way of life, our livelihood, and our way to prosperity. It is the foundation of Minnesota's economy and the health of our soil that feeds our way of life. People's lives are touched by agriculture. Farmers represent about 2% of the state, but 100% of us eat. Food access remains a key component of this bill. We are funding Farm to School to support locally grown producers and provide healthy food to our children. Grants for mom and pop shops to afford refrigeration. So communities living in food deserts where the closest grocery store may be 50 miles away can get access to good food. Grants to food shelves like Second Harvest to meet demands of hungry families while purchasing from our Minnesota farmers. Furthermore, this bill looks at addressing soil health. Many initiatives are getting uh, fund, are funding for forever green, continuous living cover crops, hemp fiber known for the carbon sequestration, and soil health financial assistance to growers. Most importantly, this bill makes direct investments to farmers. There are many items in this bill that I can name from farm business education to equipment grants to meat processing, but the largest investment we make towards farmers is establishing a grain indemnity fund. And I'm proud that that is going to be a legacy of this bill, and I value Representative Chow's leadership on this important issue. In the Agriculture Committee, we've heard time and time again from farmers who have been financially devastated by elevator collapses. After years of discussion and continued hardship experienced by farm families year over year, this will finally provide meaningful protection to producers who sell grain in Minnesota. Broadly, this is important because when farmers sell grain to an elevator, they often don't collect payment right away. In effect, they are extending credit to their elevator. What happened now seven times since 2015 is that elevators go under and aren't able to pay farmers what they're owed. In any business, that's devastating. But in farming, you work all year to market your crop. And once you do, you have to pay your inputs and invest in the upcoming year. Not getting paid for delivered grain is a significant and potentially devastating blow. And with that, I will be remiss not to mention broadband. I'm proud that the Agriculture Committee is home for broadband where we can continue to make meaningful investments for communities struggling to get access to and get quality connection. We've seen from the pandemic and now post-pandemic, broadband needs are essential. And I'm proud to support $100 million that will go towards building broadband infrastructure for unserved and underserved communities. And with that, Mr. Chair, 
I am looking forward to the discussion. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Harder moves to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment. The amendment is coded A11. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Sibley, Representative Harder, to explain the A11 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The A11 amendment clarifies that the new grain indemnity premium, premium will not be collected uh, before July 1st, 2024. Although unlikely, it's not clear if this bill would be signed into law before May 1st, which is when the new fee will begin. The amendment ensures that the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, grain buyers, and farmers will have the plan uh, in place uh, when this new fee is imposed uh, because of this bill. So please vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Bang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Harder, uh, for the A11 amendment. I think uh, it's a reasonable amendment, so I'll ask members to support. Thank you. Representative Harder. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chair Vang. I appreciate that. Thank you. All those in favor of adopting the A11 amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A11 amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Anderson PH moves to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A8. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pope, Representative Anderson, to explain the A8 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, one of the provisions in the bill that uh, has really taken off and has been doing well is the down payment assistance program, which was carried by Chair Vang uh, last year. It uh, provides assistance up to $15,000 for uh, somebody getting into the business of farming and helps with their down payments. Well. Although it's all appreciated when you get out into the southern part of the state, uh, the west central areas of Minnesota and up in northwest Minnesota, the price of land has really, really increased. And a $15,000 stipend from the state in some areas might buy you an acre or two acres or possibly three acres if you find a good deal. But um, it, when you get into a larger acreage situation, uh, $15,000 isn't really quite enough to, to bump the needle and, and really uh, provide that incentive. So what the amendment does, Mr. Speaker, is that when a farmer would purchase a tract of land that's a little bit larger, more uh, on the size that would be out in uh, greater Minnesota using a figure of 80 acres, uh, if the purchase of land is that size or larger, the uh, down payment assistance grant would be increased up to $30,000. Uh, that's what the amendment does, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I would encourage a uh, green vote, and I would ask for a, a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Further discussion? I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Anderson, thank you for the amendment. Uh, fortunately, you know, I don't want to limit uh, the uh, assistance uh, based on acreage. Um, basically, what this amendment does is it favors bigger farmers. If a farmer can afford more than 80 acres, they get the maximum grant. And that's not the goal of this program, and so I'll ask members to vote no. Representative Anderson. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Well, I wouldn't call a young farmer buying an 80-acre piece of land a big farmer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Again, 80 acres is a, a very nominal uh, size piece of ground. You know, you start in land measurements, you got a section which is a square mile, 640 acres, you go down to a half section, then a quarter section is 160 acres. So 80 acres is really uh, on the smaller side when you're looking at purchasing a piece of, of agricultural land. So again, I would encourage a green vote on the amendment, the A8, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the time. The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the A8 amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Murphy moves to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A, uh, A1. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Ottertail, Representative Murphy, to explain the A1 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is an amendment that deals with a legislative report, um, and the subject is mRNA uh, vaccines and livestock. Um, this would be uh, looking to try to find some fact-based uh, information and an assessment using the Ag Commissioner and the University of Minnesota. Uh, some recent information, and it just came out, it's pretty fresh, but there was a study done that showed that when you give uh, the, an oral vaccine, in this case, it was a COVID vaccine to a cows and then fed it to mice. Uh, the mice received a successful transfer of the immunity. And so, um, you know, there's a number of states that have already gotten in involved in this to look at it from a labeling standpoint. Uh, I think just in general, consumers want to know what's in their food. Uh, consumers know what's, want to know what's going into their bodies. And uh, with that, I just, this is just here to bring some awareness to it. It's brand new. This all really started in, in April in terms of the study that was released. Um, and so um, just as a discussion and just to take a closer look, um, with that, I would like to with, with, withdraw my amendment. Representative Murphy has withdrawn the A1 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> <clears throat> Burke moves to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is quoted A-10. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Burkle, to explain the A-10 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, the A-10 amendment uh, simply seeks to keep political science um, from affecting the duties of the, the Board of Animal Health and allowing animal science to guide the board's decisions. Um, there are numerous proposed changes to the makeup of the Board of Animal Health in this bill, and none of them are necessary, but the most, one of the most glaring examples of politicizing the board can be found on page 56 of the bill on lines 20 and 21. Um, under current statute, the six members of the Board of Animal Health are charged with selecting a veterinarian licensed in Minnesota to be its executive director. This bill instead would uh, give that power to the governor and make that executive director uh, position political. Uh, the A-10 Amendment is a small change to keep this position science-based, and I would ask for your support. And Mr. Speaker, I would ask for a roll call. Representative Burkle requests a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask for your support. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Burkle, at this Language regarding the Board of Animal Health I know has been ongoing discussion during committee and continues to be. And as I said, I'm open to uh, continuing the work on uh, the language during conference. And so uh, this can be part of the conversation. And as for now, I'll ask members uh, to vote no on the amendment. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, we witnessed last night during the State of the State Address uh, how things can get hyper-politicized. Um, but the importance and missions of, of the Board of Animal Health as we face animal disease threats in this state, uh, like CWD and high path avian influenza, African swine fever, um, this needs to be a priority here. So let's not play political games with this position. And I'd encourage everyone to support this amendment. The clerk will take the roll on the A-10 amendment. The clerk will close the roll. <laughs> the 
There being 59 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail, and the A-10 amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Jacob moved to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment. The amendment is coded A-7. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Winona, Representative Jacob, to explain the A-7 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will move the A-7 amendment and I will call for a roll call vote. Roll call vote having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Jacob. So I don't know if anyone's heard about this, but apparently Minnesota has a $17.5 billion over collection of taxes. So my amendment is really just a very straightforward amendment that simply deletes a fertilizer inspection fee and a licensing permit surcharge fee. One of the fees in this section actually raises the fee by more than 60% at a time when the state has overcollected taxes by more than $17 billion. During the last two years, farmers have suffered from enormous fertilizer costs, cost increases, and this bill piles more fees to a business that already is struggling with out of control costs. This amendment will simply give modest relief to the people in our state who toil and sweat to feed our world. Again, I ask why are we raising fees at a time when we already are over collecting taxes at an alarming rate? We need to support our farming community, not drive them out of business. So I'm simply asking for a green vote on this uh, modest and reasonable amendment. Thank you. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Jacob. Uh, your amendment deletes two very important sections uh, to the department. One section is uh, essentially provides sustainable funding for IT. Uh, I'm sure farmers don't want to do paper applications, and this uh, funding is used to maintain electronic services. And it will pay for the services that farmers valued for convenience in terms of being able to apply for grants and resources uh, at the state. Uh, this, Second part of this amendment that it deletes is the fertilizer fee. And the reason why this section is important for the department is to be able to continue services for farmers. Should this be taken away, the department will not be able to conduct any fertilizer samples for consumer protection. They will not have the funding to continue point source investigations uh, with elevated nitrogen, which, put, which may put undue burdens on growers in those impacted areas. Uh, it will also mean that potentially laying off our staff in a time of surplus. And so with that, members, I will ask uh, members to vote no on the A7. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, as was mentioned by my colleague here, my seatmate, we have a pretty substantial surplus the Department of Ag is getting a fairly substantial increase in its operating budget. And here we are adding on to a fee that farmers pay, as Representative Jacob mentioned, a 60% increase. And, you know, it's going from 39 cents a ton to 64 cents. And, yeah, we're talking pennies. And it may sound almost trivial to some of you, but it adds up. Uh, over the course of the uh, biennium, it, it amounts to $750,000 of a fee increase. And really, the question becomes, in the era of the uh, huge government surplus, do we need to be going raising fees on, on farmers? I'm sure you've all heard that in the last year or so, after the Ukraine invasion, uh, things like that, the price of fertilizer in some cases has gone up by up to 1,000%. Uh, it has tracked back down some now, but but again, just a tremendous increase in price for farmers as they face a, a squeeze of input costs with uh, the projections they can have to make an income. So again, this is almost more a, of a principle that do we need to raise the fees on farmers now when we have this uh, 17 or $19 billion surplus? I say we don't. I strongly support the Jacobs Amendment and would encourage a green vote. The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail and the A7 amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Berkel moves to amend Santa Fe number 1955, the unofficial on Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A2. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Berkel, to explain the A2 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I'd like to move the A2 amendment. On Monday this, this past week, we passed out of this chamber uh, the Environment Bill. And I'm sure you all remember the robust discussion revolving around Representative Fisher's Wolf Hunt ban amended to that bill uh, that evening. Pair that provision along with the extremely troubling language that struck out necessary transparency regarding elk management up in my district in Northwest Minnesota. And it's a, a recipe for disaster for my farmers, especially constituents in Kitson and Marshall County. It creates a problem for folks in Lancaster and Grigla. I know my fellow members across the aisle might have been inspired or might be inspired at the thought of seeing elk and wolves roam about freely, and fair enough. Your inspiration is the inspiration for the A2 Amendment, which will take the money dedicated to the creation of a new Department of Ag Climate Coordinator, new bureaucracy at $150,000 each year, and redirect it towards wolf and elk depredation funding where it will be inevitably be needed for folks back home in my district, and I ask for your support. And Mr. Speaker, I ask for a roll call. Roll call vote having been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Perkle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask for your green vote. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang. I recognize the member from Rice, Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Burkle, for this amendment. Funding the climate coordinator position will mean that we will be able to bring more dollars into our state than it will cost us to implement. Right now, there's an influx of federal dollars coming down for conservation and to support climate action thanks to the IRA and other federal measures. Existing positions within MDA focus on bioeconomy, ag land preservation, international trade, but we currently lack dedicated capacity to coordinate on climate smart agriculture. Without funding this position, Minnesota could miss out on the opportunity to literally support our farmers with funding ready to be sent to our state. Last year, the state passed a climate action framework, and the climate smart natural and working lands are key for meeting the state's climate goals. This position, will help to ensure Minnesota is making progress on that plan, ensuring that farmers are at the table when new policy proposals are being developed. We cannot deny that our farmers are on the front lines of increasingly extreme weather and a changing climate. The past two summers, we experienced intense drought, and we had to pass emergency drought relief. The damages were so great. The season before that, our farmers had too much water and there was widespread flooding. Having a dedicated position to support with programming and resources means that farmers and landowners will have the tools and support they need to be more resilient is crucial. This position can work across agencies with the U of M's extension educators, the federal government. We will be creating an ecosystem of support so that our farmers can stay on the land and stay farming. I hear from farmers all the time about the challenges of farming, tight margins, lack of markets, finding labor, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these challenges are similar to a lot of other industries, but farmers then have to deal with the changing climate on top of that. Farming is one of the hardest but most important jobs that exist, and this position is looking to work with farmers to make sure they have the resources they need to continue stewarding the land and make a strategy to support the next generation of farmers. Wolf and elk predation is something that we dedicate funds to in this bill, but in order to keep the climate coordinator position, I will advise a no vote on A2. Further discussion to the amendment, I recognize the author, Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, uh, my farmers are on the front lines, and, and the unfortunate thing is the bill we passed on Monday night is going to make things harder for them. Uh, so let's put our money where our mouth is, expanding the elk herd in northwest Minnesota without transparency and local input is a mistake. We made the mistake Monday night. 
Not managing the wolf population properly is a mistake. We made that mistake Monday night. That is what this body chose to do that evening. So let's redirect these dollars to the farmers and livestock owners who will be directly impacted due to increased predation issues based on the feel-good policies of Monday night. Vote green on this A2 amendment. The clerk will take the roll. Representative Cagle, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the A2 amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Anderson PH moves to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A5. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pope, Representative Anderson, to explain the A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have an amendment to the amendment that we'd like to get uh, in order first, and uh, Representative <coughs> Jacob is going to introduce that amendment, Mr. Speaker. Who? There is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. Anderson PH moves to amend his amendment to Senate file number 1955. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A13. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pope, Representative Anderson, to explain the A13 amendment to the A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment uh, just changes where we take some of the funding to uh, more fully fund the underlying amendment of the bill. Uh, we realize that the, the MDA department's technology fund, the upgrades are, are critical. So we're going to be, this amendment would take the funding from the uh, deep winter greenhouses that we heard in a bill earlier this session. So that's what the, the A13 amendment to the amendment does. And I would uh, ask for a, a roll call vote on the amendment to the amendment. Representative Anderson requests a roll call vote. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Further discussion to the A13 amendment to the A5 amendment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Bang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Anderson. Uh, members, please vote yes for the A13 to put in the shape that the authors won. Thank you. All those in favor of adopting any further discussion, Representative Anderson? With that, I would withdraw my request for the roll call, Mr. Speaker. Representative Anderson requests his roll call uh, on the A13 amendment. All those in favor of adopting the A13 amendment to the A5 amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails and the A13 amendment to the amendment is adopted. Members, we are on discussion of the A5 amendment as amended by the A13 amendment. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pope, Representative Anderson. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And members, this deals with the, the program called Dairy, where the legislature and the state have, have seen fit to assist dairy farmers in Minnesota with the cost of the premiums of what's called the, it's a federal program uh, called the Dairy Margin Protection Program. And we last did this five years ago, back in uh, 2017, I believe. And at that time, uh, we helped the dairy farmers to the tune of $8 million. Five of those uh, millions came out of the ag budget and another $3 million uh, with Representative Mahoney in the uh, jobs of commerce. So this time around, 2023, with the uh, $17 billion surplus, we are cutting 
the, uh, the ask that the dairymen asked for and the requests that we are giving them in this bill. Uh, the original amount was $3 million. What this does is get it up to the, the matching amount that the Senate has in their bill, $5.5 million. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I would encourage a, a green vote on the A5 amendment, and I would ask for a roll call vote. Representative Anderson requests a roll call vote, seeing 15 hands, so there will be a roll call vote. Further discussion, I recognize the member from Scott, Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and members. So this, uh, I appreciate the dairy program. It's a really great program and uh, continues to need more funding as we go through uh, this uh, system. But as this money takes, this amendment takes money out of what is the farm scale winter greenhouse program. So this is something I've been working with the U of M extension uh, for sustainability on. And what this program does in the state of Minnesota, most, uh, especially during the winter, a lot of our produce and uh, food comes from other areas of the country and of the world. And what this will do is it starts us down the path of being able to grow uh, throughout the winter months, grow in uh, farm scale winter greenhouses our food locally. So we won't have uh, supply chain issues with shortages of lettuce and things like that can, can be grown uh, successfully throughout the state of Minnesota in all regions of Minnesota. So eventually what I would love for this is to be have uh, thousands of these across to support our local food systems throughout the state of Minnesota. So I ask everyone to oppose this amendment. Thank you. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Anderson. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Members, thank you. Um, we heard the uh, winter greenhouse bill in committee and um, they're already doing this. It's a fairly successful program. So it begs the question, why do they need, need continual state funding to make this program work? I asked in committee who is going to own these greenhouses and didn't really get an answer. Uh, is it the university or is it somebody who is going to be given these things, these winter greenhouses? So I think there's some questions with that program. I'm not arguing that they're, they're useful, but it's already being employed. It does a good job in providing year-round vegetables and such. So uh, again, I, I think a better use of, the, of that, uh, that money would be in the dairy program to assist our state's dairy farmers who do a wonderful job providing nutritious uh, milk, butter, ice cream for us every day of the year. So please support this with a green vote on the A5 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the A5 amendment as amended. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the A5 amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Anderson P. Mo P. H. moves to amend Senate file <clears throat> number 1955, the unofficial engrossment. The amendment is coded A6. <clears throat> I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pope, Representative Anderson, to explain the A6 amendment. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Members, thank you for your indulgence. Uh, this A6 amendment uh, is a topic that's kind of near and dear to me. Uh, a number of years ago, we carried legislation. Uh, you may recall this if you were here back then on the rollover protection plan for older tractors that uh, did not have protection in case uh, a farmer, for example, mowing a road ditch and he'd get on a, a pretty steep slope and tip over. And a very successful program to help some of these old tractors be retrofitted with a, a rollover bar to keep them safe in the event of a rollover. It was a very successful program. A lot of FFA chapters picked up on it. And then the, that funding ran out. And then the, I think the DFL, the next time around, carried the funding to, uh, to enlarge that program uh, in an area of grain bin safety. We had a number of, of accidents where farmers would go up into a grain bin and become entrapped in, in the grain that was being augered out of the bin. And it could result in some very serious consequences, uh, even death in a few cases. So we feel that the farm safety program is, is very important. 
uh, it did not have any funding in, in this bill, and uh, we are taking the money from the, um, the Emerging Farmers Office and not, not taking actual money away, we would be keeping it at their current funding for this biennium and it's just using the increase in funding for that office to fund what I think is a very worthwhile program of a farm safety in the department's budget. And again, Mr. Speaker, I would ask for a, a roll call vote on the amendment. Representative Anderson has requested a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote on the A6 amendment. Is there any discussion to the A6 amendment? I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and uh, Representative Anderson. Uh, I agree that uh, farmer mental health is real. And um, however, there is great need to support uh, emerging farmers office. Not only do I represent a generation of emerging farmers, but emerging farmers have some of the greatest barriers towards sustaining their farms. Not only do they have lack of access to land, they have lack of access to financing and lack of access to markets. Uh, and there's a lot more work to be done for emerging farmers. Uh, we pride ourselves in supporting farmers when they are in need, and men farmer mental health is, is definitely a concern, and we still have continued funding for farmer mental health. Uh, there's a farm rural uh, helpline, the hotline that farmers can call into 24-7. There's uh, mental health counseling that's available to farmers, um, and so there has not been any divestment uh, from it, and this amendment will pick winners and losers, so I ask members to vote no on the amendment. Thank you. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it doesn't take the entire funding amount away from that office. It keeps it at, at its current safety level. And I think I heard Chair Vang say that uh, there is a farmer's helpline phone number to call. And it would be a little bit difficult if somebody is entrapped in a grain bin to uh, fish his cell phone out of his pocket and, and make a quick call. So in some of these cases, I'm um, not so sure that's that's, that's a valid point. But anyway, again, we want to stress the importance of, of farm safety and this very modest amount. Uh, we've had funding in the Ag Bill for a number of years. And again, um, there, there's got to be a way that we can find some money in the pincushion someplace to support farm safety. And again, I would ask for a green vote on the amendment. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the A6 amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail in the A6 amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Anderson PH moves to amend Senate file number 1955, the unofficial engrossment. The amendment is coded A3. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pope, Representative Anderson, to explain the A3 amendment. Mr. Speaker, thank members, thank you again. Uh, this amendment deals with the really a brand new program that's going to be instituted, uh, we think, when this bill is signed into law, the Grain Fund Indemnity Program. Uh, as Chair Vang mentioned, it's been worked on for a, a couple of years, and um, it's going to provide some uh, surety to farmers uh, when they sell grain, and uh, the unfortunate thing may happen that the elevator yes. would become insolvent God. before they get paid, and this would uh, certainly help them uh, farmer recover from a situation such as that. The, the issues, I think, with, with the bill as it stands right now, again, it, it's funding. The idea is to get the funding up to a total of $15 million. Uh, the current House version has a $5 million contribution by the state. I believe the Senate is up at $14 million. So these numbers will be, be uh, worked on in a conference committee. And what the amendment does is bring the House up more in line with the Senate number. 
and I feel it's important to get it up to about that $10 million figure, which would not trigger the automatic uh, check off from farmers as we work through this first year of when the payments would begin. There is a deadline of May 1st when the commissioner would have to announce that uh, collections would begin on July 1st. And um, the amendment that was accepted, I thank you for that, would, uh, would put that off for at least a year. But uh, there would be a lot more support for this program if uh, there was a bigger state contribution. The Minnesota soybean growers came out in favor of this uh, months ago, kind of the, the first group to come out in favor of this program. Uh, but they were envisioning full funding by the state. Uh, that has not happened so far. And we're trying to get the, uh, the numbers up there to make it a, a more significant contribution by the state of Minnesota. What this amendment does gets it up to, I think, 9.988 million. And uh, again, it takes some increased funding from other programs and uh, gets this funding up to where we feel would be more appropriate number. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I would ask for a, a roll call vote on the A3 amendment. Representative Anderson requests a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Discussion to the A3 amendment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Rep Representative Anderson, for uh, the amendment. Uh, your amendment will take away from a lot of uh, these programs. Uh, these are the farm to school programs, the urban ag, uh, the good food access programs, and for many years they've been put on the back burner and have been underfunded. And so with a surplus, we are able to make the needed investments to make up the needs and meet the needs and demands of this program. Uh, grain indemnity, we both agree that is a very important issue. And I know that Representative Chas worked hard to get your support on his bill for the $5 million. And, and I know that the Senate version has a different number and I'm open to working that out during conference. Um, and so with that members, I will ask uh, members to vote no on the 8-3. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And yeah, I would be remiss not to thank Representative Cha, who uh, carried this bill and worked very hard on it. Uh, he was a pleasure to work with. And as I recall, uh, we didn't have a lot of our amendments accepted this year in committee, but he did accept, I think, a couple, three of them on the day that we worked on it. And we thank him for that. It was like a breath of fresh air that day that we had some bipartisan work, so thank you for that. But again, I would encourage members to vote in favor of the amendment. We need to increase the funding in this account. It's going to be a very important account as farmers uh, would have some protection and they would also pay into it. Uh, it's going to be a blink off, blink on type of a fund. So I would encourage a green vote on the A3 amendment. The clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 55 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail, and the A3 amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nelson N. moves to amend Senate file number 1955. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A4. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Pine, Representative Nelson, to explain the A4 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the A4 amendment is a, um, it's a, it would a, uh, would adjust or take out the um, partner organizations of the uh, meat cutting and training grants. Uh, one of the things that's been near and dear to my heart is uh, expanding meat cutting and meat processing. Uh, last year in the Ag Bill, we were able to get uh, some meat funding for, for even in high schools. Uh, kids could be able to take a class in school and learn how to process an animal. And, you know, expanding this has been something that's been a uh, Near and dear to me, I've got a, there's an amendment I've worked on that uh, it's in the egg bill. Um, be creating a liaison between the uh, pr 
processors and the Department of Agriculture, making sure the safety plans and, and everything is followed and, uh, and really worked on together because there's, there's steps that have to fall in line and work together on. And, and uh, one of the other crucial parts of uh, meat cutting and processing is having workers that can do this, whether they have the training or the, the expertise in doing this. And, you know, it used to be that in every small town there was a, there was a locker plant. And quite oftentimes a, a child or maybe somebody in the high school would, would go and get a job there and they would just learn on the job. They would learn from training. And, you know, that, that has disappeared. That isn't really happening anymore. And so there's, a, there's definite need for uh, training. Um, there's Central Lakes College and then uh, Ridgewater and Wilmer. Uh, they've got some training that's going on. And that isn't the only place to be able to do training. But, uh, you know, we've got about, there's a, about a million dollars for training in this. And, uh, you know, that's great. The Department of Agriculture can administer out a grant and they can uh, take about 6% of it. And then uh, we can have a partner organization that would also be, can be uh, in partnership with this. And uh, this is where my, probably my biggest problem is, is they can retain 20% of these grants for, for their operation or their, whatever they're doing in this. And, uh, and so when, you know, we have, you know, near, over the next biennium, we have nearly a million dollars in funding. We're only gonna have, uh, it'll be less than three quarters of a million that's really available to actually do the training. And, and um, you know, I think that's, uh, well, I appreciate the partner organizations. I think that we end up uh, losing a bunch of the good things that we're doing through these grants. And uh, I would ask you to support this amendment. Discussion to the amendment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Bang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Representative Nelson, for your work on meat processing. I think you and I both share that that's an important issue. Um, you know, what the intention of what you're trying to do in this amendment uh, is already done in another bill in the budget already, and that's Representative Chas, which provides direct, direct grants to processors. And so, um, right now, the purpose of this funding. Uh, and what you're referring to uh, will go towards organizations that can provide the direct service and the cultural competency uh, and training to service uh, folks who want to get into the industry. And so that will be the proper best use of the money. And so I'll ask uh, members uh, to vote no on the A4 amendment. Representative Nelson. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Chair Vang and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, it's... Um, it's, it's a kind of unfortunate that we're, you know, I understand the need for the partner organizations, but I, I think unfortunately, you know, what, what we run into is we have a toolbox that is full of tools and nobody's there to be able to know how to use them. And, uh, you know, when we have these or partner organizations taking 20% of that, um, you know, that's just less people that can get trained in. So I would urge a yes vote. Thank you. All those in favor of adopting the A4 amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion does not prevail and the A4 amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended. Third reading, Senate file number 1955, as amended. Third reading as amended. Members, we are on discussion of Senate file 1955 as amended. I recognize the member from Itasca, Representative Igo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I will just speak briefly to the bill today um, because there's something in there. It ends a saga of something that once was very exciting for northern Minnesota and that was very exciting for this vision of one Minnesota. Uh, it was less than two years ago that the governor of the state of Minnesota was talking about his excitement for a project titled the Huber Woods Project uh, in Cohasset, Minnesota that was going to bring almost $500 million worth of investment to our state most of that being private investment coming to our state. One of the largest private uh, companies in our nation was gonna come to the community of Cohasset in Itasca County and build out a facility that was gonna provide over 150 family sustaining jobs that were all going to be union jobs. Um, and they had to make the decision to leave. Uh, a few months back, 
due to political headwinds and um, no changes in our permitting and regulating systems in the state. We, we became such a state of so many roadblocks that they had to leave. Um, and I was wondering, Mr. Speaker, if uh, Representative Davis will yield to a question. Representative Davis will yield to a question. He will yield to a question, Representative Igo. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Davis, I was just wondering, now that you represent the Cohasset communities, uh, I was wondering if you would just speak to kind of how that community reacted when Huber Wood Products decided to leave the state of Minnesota uh, and leave their community. Representative Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you, Representative Igo, for the question. Um, that had a huge impact on uh, the area of Cohasset, the area I now represent, uh, the area that you formerly represented. Before I answer your question totally, I want to say thank you for the hard work that you, Representative Igo, and Senator Icorn did to secure a future for uh, the Huber plant, the Huber mill in that area. It's greatly appreciated. Unfortunately, uh, something else happened. Uh, Huber decided to uh, not put their mill in Cohasset. And what that means for the community that I represent, Representative Igo, it means a $450 million plant lost to a community, a community that was depending upon that work and that prosperity. It means losing out on 150 solid jobs based in the Cohasset area. And not to mention, Representative Igo, the boom it would have created in that area in the logging industry, which we know is good for our environment. And we keep doing these things. And so altogether, it probably meant the loss of hundreds of jobs for the community that I represent. And it's left my community going, what do we do now? Well, I can tell you, Representative Igo, we're not going to give up, though, are we? But right now, it means devastation because of bureaucratic red tape and politics. And it is too bad. And I don't, I don't blame Huber. Uh, with what I've seen, I, I probably would have made the same decision if I was their company. Go to a state where they don't have to worry about all the red tape and all the mandates. Go find another community to prosper, but no longer ours. Yeah, I am sorry that uh, politics and regulatory red tape got in the way. That's what it's meant for my community. But we're not going to give up, Representative Igo. Thank you for the question. Representative Igo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Davis. I really appreciate those comments and looking forward to working together with you for what we can do for Itasca County and the, and the surrounding areas. Members, as we go through the rest of these budget bills in the days ahead, we need to make this not occur ever again. What happened to the communities in, in Itasca, in the surrounding area, the loggers, because of a proposal that we, we worked together and bipartisanly with our governor under the vision of one Minnesota left because we have done nothing in this chamber to help business, to support communities. And this community of Cohasset is also a transition community home to the Boswell Energy Center, a coal-fired power plant that this chamber has made motion to shut down. So we work together with everyone in that community, the, the leaders, the economic development, the, the county, to bring them a project to help sustain their tax base and they have now disappeared and left because we could not follow through on our promise to support them in a fair process. So this Ag Bill today marks a very, very uh, sad and tragic end to a saga that was supposed to bring prosperity to our whole state, especially to our communities in northeastern Minnesota. And I had to bring uh, mention to that and recognize that today because the pain that it has caused is still very relevant in our communities. But we're not done, and we're going to keep advocating to bring good things here. And I hope that bringing this to everyone's attention again can bring the issue to the front that we need to do more to make this state open for business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I tear into my Board of Animal Health speech, I want to thank Chair Vang for all her work on the committee. Really appreciate working with you. Um, there's some good provisions in this bill. I, I don't want to tear everything apart. I think the, the grant indemnity provisions, um, we haven't talked about broadband at all, but there's good money in this bill for broadband, soil health. 
really appreciated working with Representative Purcell, uh, Representative Cha, as Representative Anderson mentioned, um, your work on the indemnity, grand indemnity was, was great. Great to work with you. Thank you for taking amendments on your bill. But it's unfortunate that the, that the bill we have in front of us um, really does more to farmers than it does for farmers and what it does for farmers. It, it includes so many additional fees and regulations and provisions that inevitably will make our Minnesota farmers less competitive. Paired with the damaging environment bill we passed on Monday night, these effects compounding will be devastating for farmers in Minnesota. I want you to remember those bills, the uncertainty it created in air permitting, the drainage registry portal in that bill, which will affect farmers in, in their, their drainage issues. And particularly in my district, um, the A2 amendment address that we failed to put on uh, as far as wolf, wolf depredation and, and elk management. But the most troubling provision, as I mentioned to me, is, is the unnecessary politicization of the Board of Animal Health. We should not be messing around with the current makeup of the board and there is no need to have the executive director appointed by the governor. I'll specifically direct your attention uh, to Minnesota Statute 35.02. Right now, the board, right now, six members appointed by the governor. Right now, we have a board of animal health appointed by the governor. And those members appointed by the governor select their executive director. There's no need for the governor to be appointing the executive director position. The move to 11 members is currently in the bill, including a member from each congressional district is unnecessary. And the fact that all those members need is to be knowledgeable in animal agriculture versus a veterinarian or a livestock producer is just too subjective. And frankly, it's irresponsible given the challenges that the livestock industry and poultry industry face with CWD, high path AI, and African swine fever. Today is April 20th, correct? Eight years ago today, I was depopulating my own farm due to high path avian influenza. I've got a personal experience of what that looks like. I've got a personal experience of working with the Board of Animal Health to ensure that it's done properly. The current authority right now under the Board of Animal Health includes quarantine procedures, depopulation procedures in the face of serious disease threats. I could read that statute as well, but the state board may quarantine or kill any domestic animal infected with or that has been exposed to a contagious, infectious, dangerous disease if it is necessary to protect the health of animals in the state. Why would we want to give this authority to amateurs knowledgeable of animal agriculture versus veterinarians and livestock producers, the industry participants who have the most at stake? This has been the history of the Board of Animal Health, working with the industry stakeholders. So folks, the bill's got some good points. The Board of Animal stuff, health, health stuff really gives me heartburn. And I just want to remind everybody that ag is a solution, it's not the problem. The problem today is we have a lot of people here in Minnesota and, and elsewhere who have strong opinions about agriculture, but very limited knowledge of what agriculture really is. The problem here is that we have a lot of people in the state making important decisions that affect agriculture, but really don't understand what it takes to truly operate within it. And the problem is that there are a lot of people in Minnesota and in this country who depend on agriculture to feed, clothe, and fuel them, but they don't want to support or understand it. Members, we need to vote no on this bill, and I hope to see a better product coming on a conference committee. Please vote red. Representative Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Chair Vang, I want to say thank you for a well-run committee. Uh, you did a great job. You heard, uh, you heard a variety of our bills. Um, to the nonpartisan -re uh, non research, uh, you know, thank you to them. They did a great job of uh, drafting amendments and keeping up with things. Uh, thank, you to, thank you to them for that. Uh, to Mark and to, I'm sorry, my mind just went blank on your name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the CA. Uh, I'm sorry. I see it standing right there. And what's that? Thank you, staff. Thank you, staff. So. <laughs> oh, I hate that when my mind goes blank on that. Um, but anyway, it was a great run committee. Mark, wherever you're at, uh, 
um, thank you for your work as well. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, meat, meat processing is something that's been near and dear to me. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for uh, local processing, for getting to know your farmer, being able to uh, know where your food supply comes from and being part of that. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in this bill about CS, uh, probably not CSAs necessarily, but it'd be things that can help them. Uh, and really helping and assisting the small farmers. Um, I think one of the areas that, uh, that I, I, I struggle with and I'm challenged with most on this bill is, um, you know, there, there's some unknowns, uh, some tools that can probably be taken out of our toolbox when it comes to, uh, you know, plant protection products. Um, you know, and there, there's uncertainty there because uh, we don't know what the formulation is in all of these. And there's uh, some language that's going to remove uh, certain ingredients on this. And, you know, when we, when we look at a product to be able to plant, uh, plant protection product, and we're looking at, you know, the USDA, they, they've got a regulatory review on that, and then it gets licensed or registered with the state following the USDA. And, you know, when there's changes to this, uh, it takes several years to go through this process. And, and the challenges of, uh, you know, taking some tools out, and then we're, we're left with an empty toolbox, ends up being a, being a challenge. And it's, you know, it's not that we're afraid of change. That's not something that, uh, I mean, I embrace change. I enjoy it. Um, you know, I've got a story from my grandpa when he was, uh, I farmed the same farm he did. And uh, one spring they had uh, plowed down a hay field, and planted corn out there. Well, the cutworms ate off all the corn, so they had to replant the entire field again. And uh, so the second time, you know, the corn was just sprouting, and the crows came in, ate off all the corn. And so the third time, they, you know, they planted a, you know, a third time. And, you know, it's uh, where I am uh, in Hink east of Hinkley. You know, at that time, uh, that was the northern corn belt. Uh, our genetics have changed drastically since then. And so it's, uh, you know, we can grow corn there uh, today, mostly because of genetics. But it's, you know, the three different times they had to, had to replant. And, you know, if maybe the first time if they'd have been able to have some, uh, you know, uh, treated seeds, uh, maybe, the, maybe the cutworms wouldn't have eaten the corn off and had to replant. And then the, maybe the crows wouldn't have had to bother the field. And, and you know, fortunately, the, uh, the era that my grandfather farmed in, the margins were much better than they are today. Um, and I look back and see the changes that he made on his farm, uh, the advancements, the, you know, building a shed, buying land. I think of today, it's, I, I can't do it. There's no way that I could start if He started, he and his brother started with 120 acres. Uh, the fourth year, they built a little shack on a tar paper shack. The second year in, they ended up building a house. Third year in, they built a, a big barn. My grandpa didn't believe in loans. He did this off of working and saving and, and, you know, and he was able to do that in just a couple of years. And that's, uh, that's something that's absolutely foreign to our, our world today. And you know, when we look at these things, I, I'm afraid that we're putting much of agriculture in, in a position that we're going to be relying more and more on loans, more and more on the smaller and smaller margins, less tools in our toolbox, and, and not being there to have the support that we need. And while there are a great, uh, few great things in this bill, I thank you for that. Uh, Chair Vang, uh, today I would urge a no vote on this, and uh, let's work on this some more and uh, work on some improvements on it. So thank you. Representative Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yeah, thank you so much to the committee, Chair Vang, staff, Mark. You, you've done a great job in making us uh, first year uh, freshmen here have the tools we need to succeed. So first of all, as a fourth generation family farmer myself, I 
truly love to tell the story about my great-grandfather and great-grandmother. They came from Germany back in 1878. They came in the fall. My great-grandmother was pregnant. They had to build a log cabin to live in before winter set in. They tipped that covered wagon over. They lived under that covered wagon, built that house. That house is still standing there today. We've raised four generations of Jacobs in that house, including my family, and quite recently, my son and daughter, fifth generation, purchased that farm. And we dream that maybe someday their son, Rome, or their daughter, Eden, could be the sixth generation. Keeping a farm in the family for 145 years isn't easy. Our, far our, our family's done farming from chickens to sheep to pigs to dairy to crops. My uncle tells me the story about the great Armistice Day storm. At that time, we were farming sheep. It was a beautiful morning. The storm rolled in. More than 100 sheep in the flock at that time all perished in the storm. And that's how the Jacob family got out of sheep farming. Farming is hard work, but we're so proud to be the stewards of Jacob Hill and do our part in feeding the world. But you know what the hardest part is today? The hardest part of farming today is dealing with government regulations and overbearing taxes and fees. The bloat and bureaucracy before us in this bill today will likely be the straw that breaks the camel's back for many farmers who are struggling to hang on. This bill assures the government of millions of dollars each year for technology upgrades, paid in part by license and permit surcharges from already struggling farmers. The 64% increase in fertilizer inspection fees puts the government first at the expense of farmers. The bill includes nearly a million dollars per year for the next two years to fund a Forever Green program. This bill gives a 167% funding increase to the Emerging Farmers Office while ignoring the needs of existing farmers by failing to fund farm safety grants. Members, on behalf of our farming community, who work hard day in and day out to protect our environment and feed the world, I ask that you not add to the hardships they already face. I beg you to vote no today. Thank you. Representative Harder. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wanna thank you, I wanna send a thank you to all of my ag partners, um, people in my district, friends who reached out, concerns about this bill. Did you eat today? Did you enjoy steak on a, or, yeah, steak on a stick? Did you enjoy that? Did you thank a farmer for that? That came from the Cattlemen's Club. They're important to our state. You have to ask yourself that at a time, you're gonna hear us over and over and over, we have an 18 billion surplus, that is taxes. Taxes, wherever that it came from, came from taxpayers. So you have to ask the question, why? Why are we imposing millions of dollars in new fees? And if I have my math correct, the increase in the fees are approximately, I don't know, $16 million. This is not for the general fund that farmers and ag will have to pay for. In committee, if you remember, I brought up the issue about that 25 cent increase. Do you remember that? It may not seem like a lot to people. Oh, it's just a cup of coffee. I hear this a lot. It's just a cup of coffee. Okay, now it's a coffee and a donut. But when you add all these fees, also known as taxes, there comes to a point that breaks the back of agriculture. How much can we sustain? Even in my own family, we're a small family farm. It's just my husband and I. With this bill and what's in it, even we have asked, how long are we going to be in agriculture? Which I have to tell you, it, I just can't believe I have to come to that point. My mother and father, they were second generation farmers on their, on their land. 
When I was a young girl, tragedy hit. They nearly lost it all. Thank you, Jesus. My mother was a teacher. She found a job. Very important when you're losing it all. But the interesting thing is that I lived in a school district. We didn't have um, a meal program. We didn't even have busing. And so we were allowed to go home for an hour for lunch. Um, my, oftentimes my dad was there making us lunch, generally some form of macaroni and cheese because that's basically all we could afford. And you walk in the door and here's blurring on the radio, the market report. <laughs> and the market report tells you everything about what's going on in egg. I mean, who knew that there's so many different types of cattle? <laughs> Pigs talks about the market of winter wheat, summer wheat, corn, soybeans. And as a young child, I would ask my father, why do we always listen to this? And my father would remind me, it's important. It's important what people in agriculture get for the things that they produce. It stirs the economy. And he would say, you need to remember that. You need to remember what we went through was when I was young because it has an impact. And so here we are, I'm now a third generation owner and I'm, and I'm wondering how long, how long can the harders hang on to this farm? The fees and regulations contained in this bill will make Minnesota farmers less competitive, less profitable at a time when so many farmers are struggling. We have no control over input costs. That's handled by somebody else. We do the best that we can. And we should support all of agriculture. When everybody pays taxes, it should benefit the majority of the people of, of this state. However, this, this bill seems to ignore the needs of conventional farmers that are responsible for nearly 90% of the overall egg economy. It makes a difference. Farmers make a difference. Generations of, of farmers, we, we make a difference. Big, small, doesn't matter. We all have the same struggles. and We should all be working together to help each other. So as you know, I was a county commissioner. One of the things that I used to do was during harvest time, I would go to spend time at uh, the local elevator, listening to all the concerns that farmers had to say. And of course, they had to get it in a short amount of time, you know, the amount of time to empty their grain. And the, the theme seemed to uh, run through year after year. I mean, as a commissioner for eight years, it, 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 same thing, you know, the cost of everything, the cost of fertilizer, uh, the cost to maintain um, ditches, the cost to ma maintain our equipment. We have no, no control over that. And of course, they always talk about the state of Minnesota. Fees, regulations, it's just the cost of doing business. And that, that could probably go way beyond agriculture. Think of all your small businesses that, that also are struggling too. So I, I, while I appreciate the time for this bill, I think that there, there could have been more done for all of Minnesota. And so hopefully there can be, if there is more time to change things, please vote no. Thank you. The member from Rock, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I just wanted to uh, make a point today on the lack of funding in the, the base budget for the Center for Rural Policy and Development. That was a board that I had the pleasure of serving on for four years earlier in my time in the legislature. And it is an organization that brings a lot of value to our state as a whole and would encourage that we keep that in the base. They provide an annual report each year on the state of rural Minnesota. Uh, their recent reports that uh, they've had for the last year include uh, topics about mental health, K-12 education formulas, the child care shortage, housing, all issues that are vitally important to the state and the things that we deal with. They try to consider the unintended consequences for the, those making policy in, in greater Minnesota and what we have to 
deal with there, and they can dive into issues and questions that otherwise get tricky, like questions of, is there a war on ag? We just, they have the ability to, to deal with some of that. They also host uh, meetings throughout the state, and uh, most recently, last fall, they had one talking about the EMS system and our, uh, our emergency medical folks throughout the state and the shortages that we have there. They host regular podcasts, and they just work to give us facts so that we don't need to be afraid of the changes that are coming to greater Minnesota. But they recognize the changes that are coming uh, sooner than, than anyone else. They provide relevant, valuable, and actionable information, and they stay far away from the political fray, and I think that's where the real value on top of the content they have comes in this. But part of the reason why they're able to stay out of the politics that happens at the state capitol and just focus on the policy and the research and what the facts tell them is because they have that base funding. They don't need to come to the legislature every year and try to persuade whichever party is in power at the time in order to uh, do their work. So members, as this uh, budget proposal moves along to conference committee, I'm going to be advocating for the Senate and the governor's position to keep the Center for Rural Policy and Development in the base funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the member from Washington, Representative Cha. Thank you, members. I sit on the Ag Committee because I was a cattle rancher and a farmer. That too I was. I don't know what generation farmer or cattleman I am because my ancestors and my parents have always been farmers. For centuries we've been farmers in Asia. So I don't know what generation I am, but I am and I was a farmer. I want to thank Chair Vang for your leadership on this committee, along with my freshman colleague, Representative Purcell. I want to thank my colleagues on my side of the aisle and the colleagues on the other side. The Green Indemnity Fund is the core of this year's bill. I want to thank the Department of Agriculture and the Farmers Union for their support in bringing this, for, bringing this bill forward to my attention and allowing me to be the steward of this bill. I do really want to thank Lead Representative Anderson, Burko, Nelson, Jacob, and Harder for working with me on the Demney Green policy. Thank you for your collaboration and the conversation, and most importantly, the friendship that I look forward to having with all of you in this house. I want to thank the staff who is sitting right behind me for their hard work in allowing a freshman like me to be able to sit at the table I worked many years in the agriculture field. I didn't know where it was going to take me, but it led me to the Minnesota House. It led me to sit on the Agriculture Committee. And all those lived experience came together to make Minnesota better and to make this committee and this bill better. You know, in farming, in our seasons, we don't count just our livestock, we live by the seasons and how many seasons we farmed. And you're not going to make it if you think you're going to be a farmer just for a couple years because it takes generations to be a farmer and to learn from farming. There's no perfect farming season for any farmer in Minnesota. And this bill is neither perfect but we must move forward. Together, we survive, and most of all, we build fences with our neighbors and make them stronger so that we can have a better season next session. Thank you, Vogue Green, for Greener Pastures for Minnesota. 
I recognize the member from Pope, Representative Anderson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, it's been a good debate today, and I hope we all understand and realize the importance of agriculture to our state, our nation, and, and really to the world. Uh, I just did some quick Googling, and um, Minnesota, proud to say, I'd used this before, is a powerhouse in production agriculture. Over half the sugar produced in this country comes from, yeah, you guessed it, Minnesota. We're number one in turkeys. We are number two in the production of, of hogs, number three in soybean production, and fourth in the nation in the production of corn. And along with that corn, we're also number four in the production of ethanol in the United States. That's a record to be proud of, and we need to keep that going and realize the importance of, of agriculture in our state. And Representative Harder mentioned, uh, yeah, wasn't that steak on a stick good today, uh, given to us by, by the uh, cattlemen here? And uh, we say thank you, and they say no charge, just appreciate it. And the work that goes into producing those cattle, for example. I had some folks in the office today and I'd like to ask people if they raise cattle, if, if they have beef cattle, and are you calving this time of the year? And the one lady said, yeah, we are. Uh, it's muddy, it's cold, it's raining, and I guess it's snowing back home too, as, as my, my wife mentioned. But uh, farmers battle the elements seven days a week, and they get the job done. Commenting on, on the bill today, I, I think there, there, yeah, there are some good things to it. And before I, I, I forget, I want to thank staff as well, our researcher, Mark Nisley. Mark, I don't know how you keep it all straight, but thank you. Uh, we bother you weekends, nights, and uh, you get the job done, you get the information to us, so thank you so very much. Chair Vang, it's been a pleasure to work with you as well. We have our uh, phone numbers, and we uh, have open doors, talk with each other, visit. I think we learn from each other, and, and I appreciate that very much. Colby Sullivan, uh, a guy that uh, is amazing. You can bombard him with amendments, and he somehow gets them all done on time. Just, just amazing and also Ken Savory for the, uh, the uh, financial end of putting these bills together, uh, has all of the, the numbers right and can answer the questions as well, so thank you, Ken, as well. And uh, to Amanda Rudolph, and uh, it took us a while to realize that, that that big basket of candy on the other side of the table was for us as well, and, and um, uh, they kept giving me salt and nut rolls, which are kind of my favorite, so I, I really want to say thank you. Uh, Amanda, and a pleasure working with you as well. Just a couple of comments. Uh, I think there's been some, some misplaced priorities with the bill. Uh, you know, we're, we're missing the boat in some areas. Uh, and on the policy side, I, I guess those are my main concerns. Uh, we're talking about the treated seed. Representative Nelson mentioned that. And those dreaded words were taken out of the bill about the verification of need but there is still language there that the commissioner must uh, develop guidance on the appropriate use of treated seed, determine the applicability of Minnesota-specific conditions to use treated seed, determine when treated seeds would be effective, develop best management practices for situations where seed treatments are appropriate, and then uh, the bottom line is determine situations when the use of treated seed is necessary. To me, that's kind of like uh, telling which way this study is going to go, and they're going to be looking very closely and, and uh, deeply at, at how we use treated seed. And, and again, we say we don't use it uh, carelessly. Uh, it, it has a cost, and uh, it, it has a return. And uh, it helps us do things that uh, if we couldn't use treated seed, uh, we'd have to spray over the top, and some of those things could be worse for the environment. So again, uh, very concerned about taking that tool out of the toolbox for Minnesota farmers. And my concern a lot this year has been, let's not make Minnesota an island in terms of handicapping farmers from the things that uh, they need to get their jobs done. And uh, I think in some ways we are, we're kind of strolling down that, that lane. Board of Animal Health, when that bill was heard in, in the committee, as I recall, there were no testifiers in favor of changing the Board of Animal Health. There were a couple, three, I believe, testifying against it. 
Uh, Representative Burkle uh, talked very well about why we should keep it the same. It's a very important committee. And to me, it's a prime example of a solution uh, looking for a problem. Let's, let's keep it the way it is. They do a great job and uh, keep our, our state's livestock and the animals safe. You know, we, we could go on and on talking about things. Um, there's going to be a conference committee, and we hope some of these differences are, are worked out and, um, and uh, comes back to the, the House floor in a better position where uh, we can give it a red vote, or I should say a green vote. But as of now, I would have to uh, tell members to uh, think carefully, and despite the fact there are some good things in this bill, I would recommend a red vote on the Ag Finance Bill. I recognize the member from Hennepin, the author of the bill, the chair of the committee, Representative Bang. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first, I want to thank staff. Thank you to Amanda Rudolph, who's our committee aide. Uh, Molly Peterson, who is our researcher. Nonpartisan staff, Colby Sullivan, Ken Savory, and Matthew Saucer, who is our committee legislative aide. And our page, Zach Collins. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Without you, this budget bill will not be here today. I'm proud to present a good, comprehensive, balanced budget that represents both rural and urban farmers, big and small farmers, and for the environment and sustainability of agriculture. Whether it's protecting farmers, ensuring our soil remains healthy, or providing food for every Minnesotan, we are making sure Minnesota is a national leader. And with that, thank you so much, members, to the committee, for all the work that you've done. I've enjoyed getting to know uh, many of the new members on the committee and the work that you've all contributed to this bill. And with that, Mr. Chair, I ask members to vote green. I recognize the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks to everyone for a good debate over this ag finance bill. I have to uh, uh, thank my fellow farmers. I, too, am a farmer uh, raising corn, soybeans, and hogs in southern Minnesota. And I always have called myself a fourth-generation farmer, but uh, Representative Cha, you bring up an interesting perspective that I have not considered before, because my relatives before coming to this country were also farmers, and I have no idea how many generations they go back in history in other countries. Uh, that is uh, something that I will keep in mind in the future as we talk about agriculture and how agriculture is actually an international business because everyone all around the world eats. And in fact, Minnesota farmers send many of their products around the world to feed people in other countries. Um, I just have to talk about one important issue in this bill, and that is the Board of Animal Health. Um, prior to my coming to the Minnesota legislature, I was very active in the Minnesota Farm Bureau. And just before I came to the legislature, we had an outbreak of TB in, in northern, northwestern Minnesota. And the Board of Animal Health played a very important, in fact, a critical role in controlling that disease at that time. It's not easy to do. Uh, there are other places in this country where they don't, can't control TB because it's gotten so far out of hand. Uh, tinkering with the Board of Animal Health uh, based on what seems to be a, a, a whim of some sort because there was no testimony in committee uh, supporting these changes is tinkering with uh, a disaster, frankly. We've had, I mentioned TB, we've dealt with uh, avian flu, uh, we also have other diseases that exist around the world that could threaten our livestock industry should they get into this country. Uh, the Board of Animal Health is our most important state agency when it comes to maintaining the health of production animal agriculture here in Minnesota. We should not be missing, messing with that. Uh, members, please vote red on this bill. I recognize the member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that agriculture is a major economic driver in Minnesota, but agriculture is so much more. It's also a way of life for so many Minnesotans. Farmers are a backbone of rural communities, and they play an essential role in feeding our state and our nation. 
and we're also seeing more and more new and beginning farmers, including people of color. This budget celebrates our agricultural community and provides equitable opportunities for Minnesotans of all backgrounds to contribute. And I just want to share one quick story about some of the good this bill will do. Marty and Lisa Phillips from Good Thunder wrote to Chair Vang to share how they'd lost $112,000 in the Pipeline Foods bankruptcy in 2021. Then they lost another $80,000 in the Global Foods bankruptcy just a year later. They did nothing wrong. They did their work, marketed their grain, and then received a call that they wouldn't be receiving a check because the company was declaring bankruptcy. For a family farming 420 acres of mostly rented land, this was devastating. Now we have a mandate that elevators purchase bonds, but unfortunately these bonds pay an average of 11 cents on the dollar, and years later, once a bankruptcy is settled. And Marty and Lisa's case are still waiting for their bond payout from the pipeline bankruptcy years after their bills were due. Under the budget bill that we have before us today, farmers who are caught up in an elevator bankruptcy won't have to worry about losing their family farm. Farmers in our ag industries are facing a lot of challenges right now, including climate change, but I also know that farmers are resilient and resourceful. I want to thank Chair Vang for her excellent work on putting this bill together. Members, let's light up this board with green votes and stand in solidarity with Minnesota's agricultural communities. The clerk will take the roll on Senate File 1955. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 58 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to.